Dan Kotkin. Uh, I go by DK. Please call me that. Um, this is uh, uh, the gathering itself is a group of men that desire to glorify God. And we gather together in order to uh, first provide a safe place for, for all men, regardless of where they are in their uh, walk uh, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want them to feel welcome and comfortable uh, when they come join us for one of our gathering events. We also uh, connect and encourage each other. Uh, we do that through difficult times. We, we meet together and disciple each other and uh, all in an effort to, to strengthen our walk with uh, Jesus. We also create Christ-led opportunities to engage and serve in our communities. Uh, typically, we meet uh, right now about quarterly over at Pete's Place, and so this was time for us to meet again. Um, but we're going to take advantage of technology to do that um, rather than meet over at Pete's Barn, although I'd rather be there. A couple of welcomes uh, uh, to, to the uh, Zoomcast. First, Alana. Uh, thank you very much, Alana McWilliams. Uh, thank you for setting this up, and, and uh, she'll be the host and managing all the, uh, the complexities of the Zoomcast. And, uh, thank, you to, thank you to Alana who handled the invitation and all the registration. Uh, we also have some, some folks from Lead Wichita. We're excited to have you. Uh, thank you for joining. Before I get any further, uh, I would like to ask Chris Majors. Alana, if you could unmute Chris or if he can do it himself, but I'd like to ask Chris to open us in a word of prayer. All right, guys. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. Tonight, we turn our hearts and our minds to you. We trust you. You are Lord over all things, every molecule, every particle, and every virus. Everything in the heavens and earth is yours. Lord, you are the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. By you, all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Yes, all things were created through you and for you. You are before all things, and in you alone, all things hold together. O oh Lord, you are the head of the body, the church. You are from the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and you are preeminent. Blessed Trinity, in you, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through your Son, you have reconciled all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. Tonight, we lift up this time to you, and as you have said before, O Lord, your sheep know you, they hear your voice, and they follow you. May this brief moment in time be a time when we hear your voice. Bless Pete tonight as he is a voice of reason and a voice among the faithful in a lost and broken world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. All right, I'm going to uh, introduce our, our speaker who I think uh, uh, everybody probably knows. Uh, uh, Pete Oaks. Uh, Pete is uh, an important friend uh, of mine, a mentor. Uh, he's become a, just an important person in my life, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to build a relationship with him over the last couple of years. Uh, he's a local business owner. He's had an incredible impact on the community here as well as others around the world. He's the author of High Impact Life, and uh, he's going to share with us uh, uh, some things that have been on his heart and how he thinks about the coronavirus. There he is. <laughs> okay, here we go. DK, here thanks. Go. You Thank bet. you. And uh, Chris, thanks for that prayer. I think, uh, you know, in 20 or 25 minutes, we'll figure out whether I'm the voice of reason or not. Uh, I feel totally inadequate to talk about a topic like we're talking about tonight. But uh, I'll throw a few things on the table and hopefully that'll get some discussion going. Uh, 
the world has changed. Uh, it is a different place. We all know that. I don't need to, to dwell on that. But uh, let me start out with a quote from uh, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but I think it is really apropos. Uh, it says, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a, it was a spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. The last 60 days for me uh, has been a tale of two cities. It's been, I think, probably for all of us, the best of times and the worst of times. And the world has changed. For me, this is the question. Uh, has the world really changed? Or are we in a period of uh, two or three months of simply inconvenience? You know, I look at the last 60 days for myself and I look at, and all of us have gone through this. Look at travel. I had seven uh, trips scheduled in the last 60 days. Those are all gone. What a blessing, okay? Uh, working at home. We're all work. a lot of us are working at home. Uh, it's just a whole new game. It's uh, uh, the best of home is that it's home and uh, we can be a lot more casual and free at what we're doing, uh, but it's, not as nice to be together. I look at this whole thing of nationalism and globalization. I think we're going to see a major change in that. The world has been flat for a, for a long time and the whole push towards glo uh, globalization in this one world market and a bunch of that uh, has really been a push. And I look at the change in that and it will be interesting to see if that's a good or a bad thing. But I think nationalism is going to swing back and uh, take an upper hand as, as it were. Look at the whole immigration thing. Uh, what a question mark. I look at government intervention. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, but it's this whole push of capitalism, socialism, spending, stimulus, all of these things that uh, frankly concern me greatly. My, per my, whole, my personal opinion on this whole thing is that I believe we're living in one of those moments of history that we don't get to experience very often. Uh, I think it can be one of the most rewarding times for all of us. I think it's the greatest, uh, could be the greatest change for the world, and it could be the greatest opportunity for us as individuals. And I think we need to take advantage of that. I have to think of James, I call this a James one moment, but it's really a James one moment on steroids. Uh, James 1 says, uh, consider pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and let perseverance have its perfect result, that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If anyone la lacks of wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith." I, th I think this is a trial that we need to embrace. And if we embrace it and rely on God to get us through it, it, could be, it can be some of the most exciting times in our life. Um, I, I said a minute ago, um, the world has changed. And is it just a blip on the radar? And will we go back to our old ways? Or have things really changed? If we take that from a macro perspective and look at it individually, I think the real benefit to this whole coronavirus thing for me is to ask ourselves the question, are we really changed? Um, so how does this uh, impact us personally? Uh, those of you who know me know I'm a big fan in this whole concept of flourishing. And I believe flourishing is where the confluence of what I call economic capital, food, clothing, shelter, the material things that we need come together with great relationships, what I call social capital. And then they're governed by the third form of capital, spiritual capital, which is really for those of us who, uh, who are believers uh, that personal relationship with Jesus and the living of our lives according to his word. And so 
for me, as I look at the personal change in my own life, uh, I think there are three levels of change. There's our purpose, there's our passions, and there's our platform. Purpose being the deepest, it's the why. Passion being the second level up, which is the how, and our platform is really what we do. My question to you is, has the pandemic caused you to change your purpose, your passion, or your platform? You see, for, uh, for all of us, it's changed our platform. And when I talk about platform, I'm really talking about our jobs, our careers, our work schedule have changed, our time with kids have changed, uh, we're doing Zoom calls, we don't have times with friends, we don't get to worship like we have. So our platforms, our jobs have really changed. For some of us, if we go down to the next level, have our passions changed? In, in this whole last 60 days, let's say, some of you, hopefully, uh, many of you are asking deeper questions. Am I in the right job? Have I spent enough time with my kids? Uh, is my career on the right track? How about my spending habits? Uh, I don't have a job anymore. Where am I with my savings account? Am I loving my spouse? Have I spent enough time with my spouse? Those are passion questions. And hopefully uh, all of us have, have made some change in that second level down passion. What I really hope is that all of us have been challenged to change our purpose, that deepest level of asking why. And I would hope that over the last 60 days, all of us have spent more time in God's word. All of us have spent more time praying more deeply, more earnestly. You know, hopefully we've made deeper personal commitments to love God more. If we haven't done that, folks, we have let a major crisis go to waste as is the personal, uh, as is a popular thing. So I would really encourage you, if you have only let this crisis be a bump in the road for you or something that you think you will get back to normal and it's only changed your platform and some of your daily routine, I would challenge you, go deeper than that. Go down into your passions. Ask yourself, am I really living the way I should live? And, and then go one more level deep and question your purpose. I know, all of, I know everyone on this line and on this call, I know your purpose is to honor God, glorify God, and enjoy Him. But I, want, I really want to encourage you to make a deeper personal commitment there. Use this time. Use this extra time you have to get in God's Word, to get on your knees, and to be really obedient to what He's calling you to do. Just from a personal perspective, uh, I look back, uh, I'm 68 years old, and so I have been through six recessions every, about every 10 years. So I graduated college in 1974, and that was in the middle of the 74 recession. Uh, Nixon uh, was at the, the end of his time. Uh, interest rates were going up. We had a bunch of debt from the Vietnam War. The world was in turmoil. Uh, we, he needed more money, so what did Dick Nixon do? He took us off the gold standard. Uh, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just for your information, one of my big concerns is the value of the dollar. And I'm going to talk a, about this a little bit more. But today, they, they, it's not public knowledge, but from the, from the people that think they know, there is about $11 billion of gold that's owned by the United States government, 11 billion. Remember that in the last 60 days, the government has just spent almost three trillion. A trillion is a thousand billions. We have, we don't have enough gold to cover a couple hours worth of government spending at the current level, and that worries me. We went on to 80, the next one was in 82, 81, 82, next recession we had. I'd been in the banking business eight years and had an entrepreneurial itch and I wanted to start my own business. So guess when I started my business, 1982. Uh, very interesting times, but God was faithful and got me through. 
The next recession we had was in 1990. I'd been uh, in the investment banking business about eight or nine years. I decided that I wanted to own some companies of my own. And over the last, uh, in 88, 89, 90, we started buying companies. And we had owned two companies at that point in time when the 1990 recession hit. Once again, timing was not great. But we came through it, and the next 10 years were some of the most fruitful years financially uh, we've had. Uh, 2001 rolled around. 9-11 caused that recession. Uh, I can tell you that we, uh, I came within a whisker breath of going bankrupt. I would not lay off employees. I burned cash. Uh, and it, it was almost to my detriment. But once again, God was faithful and brought us through that. That was in 2001. Uh, then in 2009, of course, you all remember that. I was a little bit smarter this time. We made cuts quickly. We conserved cash. We didn't have any debt. Life was much more smooth for us. And now here we are in 2020. And of course, we're only 60 days in. And our business has taken um, a significant hit but we will come through. We, are, uh, we have a little debt, but it's very manageable. Uh, we have some cash. Uh, we have good customers, and I, I believe we will make it. But here is my concern. I believe that the coronavirus is maybe the first domino that pushes us over into this chain reaction of really negative uh, recessionary uh, issues coming, coming our way. You know, there's three ways that they say we can come out of this. We can do the V. If we went in quickly, we'll come out quickly. I personally don't think that will happen. The second option is the U shaped. We'll, we'll, we went down quickly. We'll be at the bottom for a while, but we'll climb back out. The third option for us, I believe is really w uh, what I call the W shape. We go down uh, over time, we come back up, but I think it, there'll be another dip in the W before we go. I think it is going to take some time for us to get out of this. Uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with an outfit called Praxis. They, they're a Christian entrepreneurial venture firm that helps uh, Christian entrepreneurs start. They have written a paper, and I would, uh, I would really recommend you read it. You can go on their website, praxislabs.org. But what they say is we are in a blizzard right now. We are, and when a blizzard is going on, you stay inside. You do not go outside. You hunker down, you bear through, and in a few days or a few weeks, the blizzard goes by. But you are still in winter. While winter is not fun, you can at least go out and move around. Uh, they are saying we are in the blizzard now and the blizzard will end hopefully within a month or two, but then we will still be in winter. It will be a slow grind out. They are of the mind that not only will we be in a move from a blizzard to a winter, but they are thinking we will move to more of a long-term ice age. I'm not sure I absolutely buy into that, but I think it could absolutely happen. And I think we need to be prepared economically, socially, and spiritually to deal with whatever that might look that what that might look like. So let me move out of the philosophical for a minute and move to the very practical. And what I'd love to do is give you five principles, actually practices uh, for living and leading in a crisis. In fact, these are five principles that I've lived by for the last 15 or 20 years. And they're not only good in a the crisis, they're, we should live these every day, but they need to be exemplified uh, in time of a crisis. So let me start with the first principle. And that principle is love unconditionally. Uh, Matthew 23, 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the first and second great commandments. So during this time, I think the, the main thing we need to do is love unconditionally. And it starts with loving God unconditionally. Are you spending extra time with him? Are you in his word? Are you on your knees? Are you being obedient to what he's telling you? It's difficult for us to fellowship. One of the biggest downsides to this whole thing for me is to, I, I didn't understand how I missed worship, going and praising God with a group of other people. So I would just encourage you, it all starts with loving God and making sure our love for him is greater than it ever has been. 
The second thing on loving others, it starts with your family. Hopefully you've all had more time with your family. And hopefully you won't go back. I've talked to many of you and you have done things with your kids and your grandkids that you've never done before. I have had more good times with my grandkids over the last two or three weeks or four weeks than I've ever had. I've taken some time in the afternoons to build a tree house and to do some things that I just normally wouldn't have done. And so I would really encourage you, don't go back to your old habits. Keep that time with your family. Make the hard choices now. Remember that kids spell love and your spouse spells love, T-I-M-E. It's a powerful thing. And this whole virus has brought us back. And while it's taken some economics away from us, I think it's given us a lot of time. Others, how do we love others during this time? It's interesting. I, uh, I read the other day, Bible purchases are up 50%. Google searches for Jesus and Christianity and those kinds of things are up 140%. We're seeing this in our business. Uh, never have we seen the people in our business as open as they are today about scriptural things and spiritual things as they are today. Uh, we've offered small groups and we're seeing, I think normally we might have 15% of our people in small groups. We, we offered a month or so ago and we've got almost 50 people wanting to be in some kind of a small group study. Uh, I think we need to be bold, but we need to be winsome. We need to lead with actions and follow with words when people ask. Uh, 1D and 2D relationships. 1D relationships is on the phone. Tonight we're in a 2D relationships. I'll tell you, they're very efficient and they're terrific, but 3D, while they're efficient, 3D relationships are essential. And somehow we have got to restore that. Do that however you can. And I think part of that is I go back to this whole concept of worship. So first principle, love unconditionally. The second principle, work diligently. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Work has changed for all of us. Um, you're finding that out. Um, and it's, it's, in, it's really interesting to see the efficiency that has been gleaned from some people by working at home. I'm in a small group. Uh, once a week, I meet with the five guys from uh, Africa, South Africa. And it's interesting. Two of those five said, we will never go back to the same way that we are working in the office. We are going to figure out a different way to do business. So work has changed for us. Uh, the thing I want you to understand and I think before the coronavirus, we and most of us know that our work is a means of worshiping God. But unfortunately, a lot of us, instead of treating work as worship, we worship our work. And we just can't do that. It's our, it's our platform. Work is our platform. It is the venue that God has given us to live out our purpose and our passion. Work, our job, our career is not our purpose. The, one of the greatest mistakes I think we make is thinking that our job, our career is our, is our purpose. And I just think hopefully we've learned that lesson in the last 60 days. I would ask you, what changes are you going to make about your work over the last 60 days that, that you wouldn't have made before? Number one, love unconditionally. Number two, work diligently. Number three, live simply. Guys, uh, f folks, life is too complicated. Uh, this is probably more of an economic uh, principle than anything else. But I think over the last 60 days, we've been able to experience more simplicity in our lives than we have ever before. And isn't it really great? Uh, my life is much more simple in the last 60 days, and I'm really loving it. There are things that I'm just not going to do anymore. And I, I, I've never experienced spring like I've experienced this year. I've seen trees bloom and flowers bloom 
and grass green up and animals do things that I have just missed in the past because I haven't taken the simple time to go out and walk around. And I would just think we need to really drive for simplicity. Here's how you do some of this. You need to downsize. Stuff demands time and it demands your treasure. Downsize, get rid of a lot of what you're doing. Get out of debt. Cash is king. Uh, I am telling you, um, I am very concerned about what's going on at the, uh, in, in Washington. Do you understand that the total government budget for 2020 was 4.5 trillion and the total inflows were 3.5 trillion. So they were, they were, we were had a trillion dollar deficit in the last 60 days. The government has added another 3 trillion onto that and it will approach four or four and a half. Our budget for the year will approach nine, eight or nine trillion and not, we won't take in 3.5 trillion. We'll probably take in 3 trillion. We will be down. We will add five to six trillion dollars to the national debt, which is now at 22 trillion. From George Washington through George Bush, the government spent, overspent $8 trillion. Obama took it from $9 trillion to $19 trillion. Donald Trump is going to take it from $19 trillion to $30 or $35 trillion. It scares me to death. I, I'm not an economist, so don't hold, me, don't hold me to this. But I would have to, to believe that the U.S. dollar has been devalued 15 20 or 25% in the last 60 days. The, the money that I've just told you about does not include another six or eight trillion that the Federal Reserve has just printed and pushed into the, the economy. When those kinds of, if you go back and study history, countries that have done this, it has never wound up well. That's why you have to simplify your life. You have to get out of debt. You have to build cash. You have to prepare for winter, or maybe a cold ice age. The last thing about simplicity is this. Simplicity creates solitude. And I think it's only in solitude that revelation and innovation can really happen. So take this time and make sure that you get lots of solitude because that's when God will speak to you. Okay. First principle, love unconditionally. Second principle, work diligently. Third principle, live simply. Fourth principle, risk wisely. Um, I think this is a unique time for us. And while there are lots of ominous clouds on the horizon, through the other five recessions that I've been able to live through, I've always seen that these are the times when those who are prepared uh, can take, can make the greatest gains and take the most advantage. Let me ask you this, are you repairing or are you preparing? If you've not been faithful financially or socially or spiritually and these times hit, then, then you're taking this time to try to repair things. But if you've lived like you should have, if you've lived wisely, if you've risked wisely to this point, you can move forward and prepare for the next big run up, for the next uh, time of advancement. And so I believe that you, you need to take some risk if you're willing to do that. I'm not talking about some cavalier roll of the dice. It's, a, it's, it's about prayer, it's about planning, and it's about preparation. I've got a friend in Kentucky who says, uh, you need to sell when the violins are playing and buy when the cannons are booming. And I think the cannons are booming. I've got a friend in Texas. Uh, what, he's a West Texas oil man from Midland, Texas. Can you believe that the price of oil went negative for the first time in the history of the world, I believe, a few weeks ago? They would literally pay you to take a barrel of oil. There's so much oil on tankers and in storage around the world that there were contracts that came, that came due and these people had to get rid of their oil and so they paid people to take it. 
It's unprecedented times, unprecedented opportunities. Okay, the last one. First one was love unconditionally. Second one was work diligently. Third one was live simply. The fourth one, the fourth principle was risk wisely. And the last one is give generously. If there's one word that I could encourage you with to meditate on over this time of a coronavirus, it would be generosity. Uh, generosity is the one thing that we can do to show a non-believing world that we have deep faith and we mean what we say. It's faith in action, as it were. And remember, uh, giving is not just about writing a check. You have three things you can give. You can give money, you can give time, and you can give spiritual encouragement. So you may not have much money right now. You may be out of a job. For whatever reason, you may not have money, but you can give time and you can give spiritual encouragement. I told you a few minutes ago that, you know, you needed to load up on cash. And if you have cash, uh, great, keep that. But this is the one place where I would violate that cash rule. It is a test of your faith if you have extra cash to give it away. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that God even counts the thing, the money that we give out of our excess as generosity. I think he is looking for us to see if we will give out of our, out of our principle, out of what we really need. I keep, I think back to the, um, the story in the old Testament of Elijah and the widow from, um, the widow that had, uh, a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour left, which was really her last meal. And what did she do? She, she gave that back to God by preparing a meal for Elijah. And guess what happened? She gave out of the last thing that she had. Are we willing to do that? He who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows generously reaps generously. So I would really encourage us to be generous. Uh, let me wind up here by just finalizing a few things. I don't mean to be negative, but I do think we are going to see difficult times ahead. But difficult times are not a problem for those of us who have faith, who have fellowship, that we can come together with others, and who are really trusting on God and living by faith. I think it's one of the greatest opportunities we have to make a difference for God and his kingdom. So treat this uh, opportunity as once in a lifetime thing and go out and make a difference. So DK, I'll, with that, I'll turn that back to you. Thanks, Pete. That's awesome. So let me, uh, let me ask a few questions. Let me start with, uh, one of my own, you, you mentioned uh, early in your talk about, uh, you know, really changing. And you talked about the three levels, uh, the, the deepest level being the purpose, the why. So uh, for, for someone who's not been through that process or maybe thinking about how do I even do that? Where do I start? How do I, uh, how do I process what my purpose should be in a time like this? Yes. So the purpose question is really uh, embodied in the question, why did God put me on the face of this earth? What, very simply, why do I exist? And to really make this really simple, I think there's two reasons. You're either living for yourself or you're living for something greater than yourself. You're living for the God of the universe. You're living for the God who created you. And so in these very difficult times, it's very easy for us to go back because we are fearful and not faithful. We start thinking of ourselves instead of, instead of trusting God. So I think the purpose question, why do I exist? And am I living for myself or am I really living for God? The, the, the problem with most of us is we know we should be living for God, but the world has such a pull on us that we live with one foot in the, in the world and we live with one foot in the kingdom and we're in this mushy middle of mediocrity and Revelations 3.15 tells us what God thinks about that. You're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm and I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. So I think it is really important during these times for us to be uh, purpose-driven. 
That's great. So let's say we have a, one of us, <clears throat> maybe somebody on this call, or uh, we have friends that have recently lost, lost their job. And as you mentioned, so much of what we do, define, we allow it to define who we are. And so how, how would you in, uh, encourage someone who's lost their role, lost their job, uh, really starting to question, uh, why is this happening? Uh, is my is my purpose? Did I have it wrong? Was I pursuing something that wasn't what was truly God led? Yes. So I think the first thing I would do when I was visit when I was was talking with these people, figure out what their need is. Is it a financial need? Is it a relational need? Or is it a spiritual need? Okay. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, if they've been wise financially, they at least have some. Uh, some dry powder that they can get by with. If they don't have that, then I think as Christians, we need to figure out, can we come alongside and help them financially? Okay. They may not need financial help. They just may need great encouragement and uh, they need someone to cast vision for them. I think, you know, when we're up to our waist in alligators, it's tough to remember that our primary purpose was to drain the swamp. So when people have lost their job or going through this very difficult time, we need to be the source of reason and the source of hope and come alongside them and show them a way out. Uh, If we all know what can be, if, if I do this, this will happen. If we can show people that, and oftentimes that's a, if we can show people Jesus, it really gives them hope. It gives them eternal hope. Uh, but it may it may start with economic or relational capital before we spend that spiritual capital on them. Great. So this is my last question before I go to the questions that we received on emails. So um, are you cutting your own hair or, I mean, what do you do with the stuff that goes around your ears here? How do you, do you do that yourself or? Yeah, get you one of these little deals and just kind of, you know, don't look too close, <laughs> but it works. <laughs> hey, and the price is right. I'll tell you that. All right. All right. Good. good. I, you know, that, that might be, you know, I, I just figured it out. Here's a way to simplify it. Just buzz your head. Yeah. Faulkner is, uh, he's on mute, but he's nodding up and down. He's ready to teach us how to do that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the right idea with the, with the buzzer there. That'll take care of it. Yeah. In that, on that beach, I'm just worried about his top. I hope he's under an umbrella there. All right. I'm going to start, um, Chad Edwards uh, asked a question that I'll, I'll, uh, I'd like to ask you, Pete. Uh, his question was, um, how do you see the kingdom of God advancing during this crisis? Yes. Yeah, so one, just in our own businesses, I see uh, our team members having a, a new openness to talk about things other than that are the trivial things. So we are, uh, and I think, I think that's two things have happened there. One is there's been these outside forces of coronavirus Two, as we've seen that we've really stepped up our uh, communication and boldness and sharing hope with them. So I think it's probably a combination of two things. And I think that's really the way it works. God has created this trial and this tribulation. And so those of us who are believers that have the answer need to take advantage of that and move in and and start sharing. So as I talk with business people uh, around the world, actually, uh, it is really an encouraging time. Uh, So many stories of people just seeing really movements of God. I think I maybe talked about this. Uh, you know, there's a 40% increase in Bible sales. There's a huge right. increase in people Googling uh, Jesus and salvation and those kinds of things. So I think, and I think maybe the biggest thing is God, we, we, have, we have created idols out of our materialism. And I think God, to some degree, is stripping those idols from us and showing us what is real. If we just all look at our own lives, 
where we were 60 days ago and where we are today. Would any of us really give that up? No, I think it's, I think we'd all embrace this. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Good. I will uh, see that the next question came in from Austin Smith. He asked, uh, what's next? Who are you discipling and what does that look like? Yes. So I've got several groups that I um, am involved with. I've got a group in Wichita and um, DK, you're part of that. And so I stay in touch with you guys on a regular basis. And then I've got a South African group and I have an Indian group. Uh, and then I have one other group that is really not me discipling them. Uh, it, it's really, all of these groups are really not so much me discipling them, but I think all of us coming together as believers and saying, uh, what do we need to do to encourage each other? I, I love um, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. So I think this, this fellowship, while it is 1D and 2D and not 3D, it is still really essential. And it's, it's really a matter of encouragement. It's, uh, I have people call and say, what do I do here? What do I do there? It may be an investment deal. It may be just a personal issue. And so I think all of us need that, that fellowship even more now than uh, when things are going well. Yeah, thank you, Pete. I, I, I agree with you. I, it never fails that when you know, two or a few guys get together and there's trust uh, and just getting a chance to talk to each other never fails. There's an opportunity, as you said, to encourage each other, whether that's I need encouragement or someone else or, or all of us, whatever times we, we may be going through. And it's such a powerful, um, powerful love that comes from brothers that are that are there for each other, picking each other up. Yes, and I would you know, just, um, I have a weekly call with, uh, there are actually probably 20 business people on that call every week, and it's the same 20 business people. And it will start off typically by having uh, one person share where they are, and then we just open it up. What did you learn last week? What are you seeing? Uh, there are investment ideas. There are uh, how do we uh, minister to our employees' ideas? So I think these almost informal get-togethers were, and you, and if, and I think it's really beneficial, almost on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis, to touch base with those people and just keep working away at it. I learned I can't wait for that call because I know there's something I'm going to take away from that that'll help me this week. That's great. Pete, you talked earlier about spending time with your family and your grandkids and, and uh, being at home more. And I know that that has been obviously, uh, you know, I've been, been at it, you know, here at the house like everybody else. And we had the, uh, I'll say, the opportunity to go on a quarantine two weeks of two weeks before it really even hit the U.S. because of some travel I had in Europe. And what has been just fantastic for me is the time that I've gotten with, with my family. Um, uh, you've heard this from me before, but I rarely get home in time to have dinner with my family. We probably have one meal a week together in normal times and we're, we're having dinner every night together. And that's how I was raised. That's how my wife was raised, but we've allowed our lives and the busyness of it to change our family pattern. So how, how are, uh, you discovering new ways to serve your wife and your family? Uh, through this crisis. This question is coming from Abraham Rodriguez, sorry. Um, and how has that uh, changed your relationships with those that are closest to you? Yeah, so when you're home a lot more, um, <laughs> your your wife comes up with a lot more ideas of things that need to get done. And it's interesting, I've got a good friend that just says that's how he serves his wife, you know, take out the trash, just these simple things. Uh, I've got a really good friend who almost got a divorce over the fact that he wouldn't throw his dirty socks 
in the in the right place in the in the hamper. And he said, the way I serve my wife is this simple thing of picking up my dirty socks and putting them in the putting them in the right place. And and it's it's uh, I think we think there's needs to be this big um, just this kind of unreasonable expectation that you know, we'll do this and we'll do that and these grand ideas and whatever. No, I just think we need to serve our spouses in the very mundane routine things of life. Those are the things I hate to do, but I am slowly learning that when I do those things, oh my goodness, it shows Deb that I love her in unbelievable ways. Uh, it's not buying flowers or diamonds or taking her out. If I just do these simple things like take the trash out. It, it tells her I love her and respect her. And those are the things that I think we really need to do. Before this, when we were so hurried, we had an excuse not to do it. Now mm -hmm. we don't have that excuse. Oh, that's great. All right, the next question uh, from my neighbor here, Brian Annie. Uh, he's asked two questions. I'm gonna ask the second one. How should we, as Christ following business leaders, think about our businesses during this crisis and plan for other unknowns in our business and economy? Yes. So a lot of you know that I believe the purpose of business is not to maximize shareholder value, but to be a catalyst for flourishing. And what a great time to be an example, uh, to, to be a catalyst for flourishing. And once again, flourishing, is making sure the economics are taken care of, you have great relationships, and you have um, shown people the powerful love of Jesus and what he's done for you. So I think that is, you know, top of mind is what we should do. As Christians, we've seen just in our business, you know, one of the things, we've just tried to do some simple things. One is we've communicated, communicated, communicated. We've told them exactly where we are. We, we, we're not pulling punches on how bad it is. We tell them that, but then we, we try to share with them the plan that we have, okay? Uh, we try to comfort them in that. We try to do everything we can to, uh, to make their life as easy as possible. Last week or, yeah, last week we actually uh, had pie day. so. We're still working. Our people aren't shut in, okay? So they're still working. They come to work every day. That's troubled a lot of people because, you know, they're in a shop with 80 or 100 other folks. So we've done the social distancing. We've done all the clean, cleanliness things. But on top of that, we walk around the shop. We encourage them. We brought pies in for everyone. We, we've given people a bonus this month for showing up. We'll probably give them a bonus again for next month showing up. So there are just those little things that I think we can do to let them know we care. But I would really, I really think it's important to one, be honest with them, be authentic with them, um, and share hope with them. And, we, and if anybody has hope, uh, those of us who are Christian should be able to mm. some way uh, communicate that with our folks. Yeah, very good. Uh, Stan uh, Sheldon had a had a question uh, that might, I think is a good follow up to this. What might be special ways to bless our clients during this time? Yes. So I am a. I hope I can divulge this, but I am a client of Stan. So Stan, if you would just cut your fees by fifty percent, will be great. <laughs> All right, on to the next question. Do we need to talk to you more or are we, are we all covered on that? <laughs> so uh, here, here is what, here's what I think we can really do for our clients. As I said before, in times of crisis, that's when, that's when real leaders step up and, and um, lead the way. And, and what, uh, we have a saying that connected leaders bring vision humility, and courage to a team effort. Those are the three things that I think you can do for your people and for your clients. Connected leaders bring vision, humility, and courage to a team effort. The vision to see what should be done, 
the humility to believe that with God's help, it can be done, and the courage to persevere until it is done. This is not simple stuff, but, but as leaders, we have to stay in there. And once again, the power of vision, the power of humility, and the power of courage, uh, however we can translate that, and it may just be phone calls, lots of communication, give them ideas. I think once again, that goes back to, um, if you've got four or five clients, maybe you could have a weekly 15 minute call and just share ideas with each other. I don't know what that might be, but I think communicating vision, humility, and courage in these times is huge. Hey, I'm Pete, this is Stan. Um, I appreciate the, um, the thought on the, the deducted um, fees. That sounds like a, a great idea, but you and I have already had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Stan, give me so, a break. So that, would be, so that would be twice now. No, I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> Love you so much. No, it's great. Thank you so much, Pete. That was um, good insight, though, on... I think these times it's really weird how to be, uh, we're supposed to be courageous and we're supposed to be tender. We're supposed to be able to lead boldly, but be gentle. Th those are all kinds of tricky things to do in, in times like this. So I appreciate that. You bet. Yeah, very good. I was just looking at the five principles to figure out if Pete's second effort was working diligently or risking wisely, uh, which one that fell into, but, <laughs> but applaud the effort. It sounds, it sounds good. So my next question uh, is from Gary Ginch. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Um, uh, he, he asked a great question. I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase it, but talked about small business uh, owners and the difficulty uh, of, of really being of trying to get those government funds are not able to get to uh, everybody. And his question is, is what's the best approach to assist these brothers and sisters outside of just financial aid to help them move forward, uh, maybe in a new direction? Yes. So first of all, I really believe that the government is trying to get funds to everyone who needs it. So the, uh, I would encourage everybody, if you have friends who are small business owners and have not gotten that, they need to, the best thing they can do is find a bank that will go to work for them. Uh, there are several banks in town who are aggressively, um, you know, putting efforts together and will really go to bat for you. If you have to walk, down to the SBA yourself and just talk to them. There are funds available if you fight for them. And uh, you know, they just rolled out another 450 or 500 billion. So I think those funds are there if you work for them. Other than that, what can we do? I think it goes back to the last question that maybe Stan asked. I think coming alongside people and just helping them understand, uh, we ask, we ask three questions in business. Is it real? Can we win? And is it worth it? And I think you could, you could, if you're walking along some, beside somebody, is it real? Is your, is your product real? And is the market real based on the changes that have happened in the last 60 days? If it's not, don't keep fighting that. Pull the plug, shut the thing down and go find something else to do. It's a tough, it's a tough decision to make, but you have to answer that question honestly. Is it real? Is the market real? Is the product real? If it's not, shut it down. If it is, move forward. Then you go to the second question. Can we win? Can we win in the marketplace and can we win as a company? Is our product going to be good enough? Uh, are the competitors too difficult for us? So you could do a little bit of counseling along those lines. And the third thing, is it, is it worth it? It's interesting, most of the time I can answer when I'm working with people, you can get a yes answer on is it real? And you can get a yes answer on uh, can we win? But is it worth it? If it takes 12 hours of day, you're gonna lose your marriage, you're gonna lose your kids, you're gonna lose your health, pull the plug on that thing. 
And that is where spiritual wisdom, I think, can really come in. Uh, and, and you don't have to be a, a genius in business to kind of work people through some of these, these questions and thoughts, but really come alongside of them. Be that, you know, there is, uh, there's wisdom in counselors. You can't wage war without counsel. So come alongside them as a counselor and you don't tell them the answer, just ask the questions. Because by asking them the questions, you'll force them into the answer. What they need is somebody just to come along and, and prod them into to thinking about where they are, to thinking about their strategy and their operations and their execution. So be that, be that person who asks really good questions. And I think that's the best way you can help them. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Well, thanks for those, uh, those questions. What I'd like to do, we're, we're about at the hour, but uh, if it's okay, Pete, if you have a few more minutes, I'd like to see if there are a couple other questions from the group, a bit of an experiment, and uh, we'll see if we'll, we'll take a risk. I'm not sure it's a wise one or not. So, Alana, uh, what, what I'll do is just open it up and see if, um, if there's any questions. Uh, hopefully, everybody can just take yourself off mute and... Uh, uh, and, and uh, you can ask your question directly to Pete. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, interject if that's okay. Please. You uh, mentioned um, the gold situation, number one, and then you also talked about how we are, uh, the, the position we're putting our, the, the United States, the position it's putting itself in uh, with debt, uh, is the rest of the world governments, are they on the same path? Are they doing the same things? And uh, this, uh, this ice age, I don't, I, I don't know how one gets out of this without a disaster. We've got um, Mitch McConnell talking about states declaring bankruptcy as opposed to us bailing them out. N neither one of those sound good to me, but I just, uh, uh, just some general thoughts there about where we're at and what, what the snowball that's rolling down the hill, it's, I think, seems like it's going to gather everybody up. Yes. So probably the, uh, the, the country that has the largest debt is Japan. So they have 200% um, of their G, they have debt that is equal to 200% of their gross domestic product. So uh, in the United States, we are 100% debt on our gross domestic product. So all the goods and services that are created in the United States are 22 trillion a year. And we are at 22 trillion in debt now without the 4 trillion we've just added. We're going to be at 120% debt to GDP in the next few months. So I, I and, and what's happened is uh, most every country in the world is doing this. There, there's fiscal policy and there's monetary policy. Fiscal policy is where the, the Congress just spends money and they spend it on programs and that puts money in the economy and, and fluffs things up. The other is monetary policy where you have the nation's bank, the Federal Reserve. And what they do is they just, they flood money into the system too. So in addition to the 4 trillion fiscal policy, 4 trillion spent by Congress, there's another 6 trillion that's, been, that's being flooded in by the Federal Reserve. So it is just mind blowing. And if you look historically, one of two things happen. You have a major reset or you have this thing with uh, runaway inflation because the only way that governments can get out of debt is to inflate their way out. They have to pay with cheaper dollars. And what will happen at some point in time, my concern is Trump's cut taxes. So we've pumped the economy. Then we've, during that time, we should have reduced debt. But now we had the coronavirus and governments, when any institution is too big to fail, it's too big. And the government is too big. A lot of businesses are too big. And so they just, when they figure out that all they have to do is run the printing press, to get you out of trouble, 
then that's when you are in trouble, I believe. Like, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but yeah, I am I am pessimistic. Thank you. All right, we have time for another question. Is there another question among the group? Wait five more seconds. Pete, this is John. Um, what would be, is there, I mean, you gave us a verse earlier. Is there a verse that the Lord is really speaking to you? Maybe it, that was the same one. Is there another one that keeps coming to you again uh, through this? Yes. So it's my life verse, Psalm 78, 72. It's talking about David. It says, so he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with the skillfulness of his hands. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with the skillfulness of his hands. There are four character traits in that one verse that all of us need to embrace. The first is, so he fed them. When you feed somebody, you, you pull them into your table and you feed them. And the reason you break bread with people is you want to connect with them. So the first C that I would encourage you to have is to be a connector. You have to connect with people. You have to, and you, and I think the value that goes with connection is service. Okay. If you really want to connect with people, you serve them. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. Integrity of his heart is, identifies the second C and that's character. We have to be men and women of character. And the way we have character is we honor God through the virtues of truth faith and character. Truth is a head thing. Faith is a heart thing. Obedience is a hands thing. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them. If you've ever been guided, I, I, every year I've got a friend that's got a fly fishing ranch and he invites me up. So I have a fly fishing guide with me. Let me tell you, the, 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 the third C is demonstrated by a guide. They are committed people. The number of times that guy has to pull my fly out of a bush or teach me this or that, his level of commitment is unbelievable. So you have connection, character, commitment, and then the skillfulness of his hands. You have, we have to be comp people of competence, the 4C. There's actually a 5C that's not in there, and it's called capacity. And capacity is the ability to take those first four C's and synthesize them. And that's what really gives you great leverage. If you find a person that has character, competence, commitment, connection, and can put those together, uh, boy, there's a powerful individual. That's great. John, great question. And Pete, thanks. Thanks for that. You bet. All right, folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this up here. Uh, first, let me thank uh, again, Alana, uh, for, the, for organizing and managing. Everything went very, very well. Alana, thank you. Pete, uh, I don't know how to thank you, but, uh, but thank you very much. Um, you're obviously very busy. I know you had uh, the, a fam the family over uh, today and still carved out time for us and to prepare for all this. So thank you, brother. Appreciate that very much. My pleasure. Um, if you uh, have any uh, interest, uh, if you've not read Pete's book or, or some of the things that he's talked about, if those aren't uh, uh, the high impact life that you've, if you haven't been exposed to that, um, you can, uh, Pete is the, you mentioned it the other day, is, is the website up uh, for, for enterprise stewardship? It is. Uh, yes. Go to highimpactlife.com. Highimpactlife.com. Perfect. Thanks, Pete. Great. Any, Pete, do you have any closing comments before we? No, it's, uh, all I would tell you is, uh, remember, leaders bring vision, humility, and courage to a team effort. Mm -hmm. Go out and lead. Great. So I'm going to close this uh, uh, by reading, uh, I was reading uh, just yesterday in First uh, Thess Thessalonians, Five, uh, chapter five, 
And I'm going to cut through some of the verses, but uh, they're 12 through 18. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I was reading that and just knowing uh, what Pete was going to share, and obviously it uh, uh, it gripped me, just the, the pain that many many people are going through, and at the same time, the joy that, that we can find in this. And for those, that, those of us that have a kind of relationship with uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, as Pete described, just a great opportunity to be closer to family, to reach out to those that may be struggling to serve them. Um, so, with that, I'll close. Everybody, thank you very much for your time. Look forward to when we can meet again in person. Thanks, Take Peter. Care. God bless. You.